Well, good morning, FBK. It has been an incredible morning of worship, hasn't it? Man, as if you're new here, I'm kind of new here too, right? Still getting to know everybody. My name is Landis, and I get the honor and privilege of serving our church as the student and family pastor here. And one of the things that we've had um, in, in our family so far, people of this church have come up, hey, how do you like Ohio? And I'm like, I, I love it here. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to call home, right? I, I tell everybody it's a lot more wet and a lot more green than where we're from, um, and, and that's okay, right? We love it here. It's a great place to call home. It's a great church to be a part of. And I just want to say thank you for all of you that have come up and welcomed our family. You've made us feel right at home. And so thank you for just embracing us, being with us, making us feel like this is um, our church because it, it is. So this morning, I have the honor and privilege of bringing you the Word of God. As we get started, I want you to think about this question. Have you ever desired something only to get that thing and be dissatisfied with it? I want you to think about a time in your life where you craved something, you desired something, you wanted something, and yet you got that thing, and it wasn't what it was all cracked up to be. For me, when I think about that question, I think about an old baseball mitt I had. So growing up, I played baseball, loved the game uh, of baseball, and as I was entering into high school, I needed a new glove. It was time for a new one, so I begged and pleaded mom and dad, mom and dad, I really need this glove. I need this one. This is the one that I need. I made a good case. Mom and dad purchased me the glove. Man, it was the glove of my dreams. It was a Rawlings Pro Preferred, top of the line Rawlings baseball mitt, the best of the best. 11 and a quarter inch infield glove. Man, I love that thing, or so I thought. So I waited and I waited and I waited for this thing, and finally it comes in the mail, right? And I open that package up, and immediately, what do you do when you get a new baseball glove? Man, you got to break it in, right? So I'm forming the pocket, loosening up the leather, opening up the straps, trying to get that conformed to my hand, get that pocket in there to be really good. And if I'm honest with you, it was okay for a little bit after playing with it. I hated that glove. I hated that glove. Man, it was hard. It was coarse. The, the leather was tough. Had a tendency, if the ball was hit with a lot of top spin, to kind of squeak out of the top, top of the glove. Man, I hated that glove. Man, what I pleaded for, what I asked for over and over, I begged my parents, Mom and Dad, this is the glove I want. It's going to set me up. It's going to push me over the top only to get what I thought I wanted, and I was dissatisfied with it. See, today when we come to the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 6, Solomon, he gives himself the nickname the preacher. The preacher, he's going to say a very similar thing. He says, in human life, we have this tendency to crave things, to desire something, only to get what we thought we wanted and be dissatisfied with. So there's a tendency in the human life where we search out for meaning, we search for purpose, we search for enjoyment, only to never find it. Solomon says that the hard truth of the matter is that you can spend your entire life searching after the things that you thought would satisfy the cravings of your heart only to get what you craved and be dissatisfied in. So if you've got a copy of the Scriptures this morning, I want to ask if you would open them up, turn them on, find Ecclesiastes chapter 6, and then stand with me in honor of God's Word. We're going to read verses 1 through 12, and I'll be honest with you, there are a tough few verses to read. Verse 1, There is an evil that I have seen under the sun. It lies heavy on mankind. A man whom God gives wealth and possessions and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he has no burial... I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. 
Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the same place? All the toil of a man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? What does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better in the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This is vanity and a striving after the wind. Whatever has come has already been named. It is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? For who knows what good for man while he lives a few days of his vain life, and then he passes like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning and we open up your word and we know and we, we, we affirm that it is a, the living word stronger than any two-edged sword. And God, that today there's going to be a lot of cutting and piercing from your word, showing us where we are longing for satisfaction apart from you. God, at the end of the day, there's nothing other than Jesus and Jesus alone. A relationship with you that will satisfy the deepest longings and cravings of our lives. So today, by your Spirit, would you expose those areas of our life where we are trusting to find satisfaction apart from you. And then at the end, that we would make the decision, the commitment to chase after you rather than other created things that aren't able to satisfy our soul. So meet with us today. Change the people that we are so that we look and live more like Jesus. We ask that in your name. Amen. You can have a seat. You remember last week that Ephesians, or Ephesians, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 is a bit of a high point in the book of Ecclesiastes. We ended our time last week with this sense of hope, that, that there is hope for us, that we can make a choice to, to live in a world in which we honor God. We can draw near to Him through wisdom where we can enjoy God and His good gifts that He gives to us. But now we flip the chapter and we come to Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and Solomon, the preacher, he points out a different reality. It's as if Solomon is putting up two very contrasted and different avenues in which we can live our lives. We can make the choice to live in an in an Ecclesiastes 5 world where we draw near to God, where we love Him and we worship Him and we can enjoy Him and His good gifts. Or we can live in an Ecclesiastes 6 world where we're living under the sun, chasing after everything that we think will give us meaning, purpose, and hope, only to never find it. Solomon says that the, the life under the sun, a life lived apart from God, will be full of expectation, yet absent from satisfaction. Solomon is saying that if you choose to live your life apart from God, there will be this journey that you go on, and you will run and run and run, and you will continually try to chase after things that you think will satisfy the deepest longings and cravings of your life only to never find them. A life lived apart from God, it will be full of expectation, yet absent of satisfaction. It's led some commentators to say that Ecclesiastes chapter 6 is the darkest chapter in all of the Bible. They say that because Solomon wants us to, to think about this. He wants us to think, evaluate our lives, that at the end of the li our lives, we can look back and see that life, if we're honest, was just a long list of disappointments. Hoping something will satisfy. Only to realize nothing we chased after was able to make good on its promises. So in our text for today, Solomon points out four disappointments that are common in life. Four disappointments that are common in in life. Let's start in verse 1. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun. It lies heavy on mankind. A man whom God gives wealth and possessions and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity and a grievous evil. 
what the, what the preacher is doing here is that he is framing everything in chapter 6 in universal terms. He says, what we're going to be speaking about here, the disappointment in life that we will experience continually, it's not, it's not uncommon. It's actually a severe disappointment. There is grand misfortune. It's commonplace in life. It's a universal human experience to seek out something that we think will satisfy only to find out it doesn't. And Solomon, he begins with the very first thing. He says, well, what is this disappointment? It's that wealth and possessions do not satisfy. Wealth and possessions do not satisfy. You see, as we walk through the text, we're supposed to imagine a man that has great fortune. Great fame. He's got everything that he's ever desired. Man, he's worked hard. He's acquired wealth. He's acquired possessions. He's got everything that he ever needs. He has it all. But he cannot enjoy it. He cannot enjoy his wealth or his possessions. I mean, can you imagine the frustration with that? I mean, let's just assume that we were able to gain the whole world. We were able to have all of the wealth and all the possessions that we've ever wanted. We've worked and we've toiled and we've acquired wealth. We've received all of our possessions. But yet we cannot enjoy them. Martin Luther said it this way. He says that this text describes a man who has everything for a good and happy life, except he doesn't have one. I mean, can you imagine the disappointment with that? To have everything that you've ever wanted, wealth and possessions, fortune and fame, everything that ought to give you a good and happy life, yet you do not have one. We would agree that's a grievous evil, isn't it? That is a disappointment. But something I find incredibly insightful in this. Notice verse 2. Yet God does not give him the power to enjoy it. God does not give him the power to enjoy it. So he's worked hard. This man, he has everything that he has ever wanted. He's gained the whole world, fortune and fame, Yet God is sovereignly choosing to allow this man to be dissatisfied in his riches. What are we supposed to make of that? Why would God allow for someone to acquire wealth and possession, fortune and fame, yet not enjoy those things? Well, I think to answer that question, we begin by Asserting that God is good, isn't He? God is good. And since God is good and He is the creator of you and me, He knows what is good for us. What if God in His goodness is allowing us to be dissatisfied in our wealth and our possessions to show us that that, that apart from Him, there is no life? In other words... God knows that there is no such thing as happiness apart from Him. So why would He give you wealth and possessions, fortune and fame, things that may and things that will push you to trust in other things rather than Him for your fulfillment and your satisfaction? Like perhaps, what if God is gaining the attention of those that have wealth and fame? What if the way that God grabs your attention, He grabs your heart, is to allow you to make it to the top? If God allows you to retire early, to get that house that you've always wanted to live in, to drive that car that everyone else wants to drive, to be able to purchase that beach home that you will frequent in your vacations, 
only to acquire all of this wealth and all of this possessions and you be discontent and dissatisfied with it? What if God allows you to feel all of that emptiness, all of that dissatisfaction to show you where your fortunes, your treasures are misaligned? What if he would allow you to gain the whole world and you would be so discontent and dissatisfied in it that he's showing you that he and he alone ought to be your greatest treasure. That he and he alone is the one who is designed to satisfy your soul. You see, Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he says that we have eternity written on our hearts Some people like to say it this way. We have a God-shaped hole in our souls that God and God alone can only fill. And when He fills Himself in our hearts, then we'll be satisfied. But in our sin, in our human nature, we like to take that, that, that hole that is meant to be filled with the eternal and we try to fill it up with the temporal. That we increasingly, consistently, Chase after the created rather than the creator. So you get to the end of your life and you've chased after wealth and possessions all of your days and you realize, I am dissatisfied. When that happens, that's God getting our attention. He says, come to me. I am the only one that is able to satisfy the cravings of your heart. So wealth and possessions, they have no power to satisfy. But also, notice verse 3. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to this one place. Disappointment number two, a long life and a family legacy do not satisfy. A long life and a family legacy do not satisfy. Now, as we begin to walk through this, this section, there's a little culture going on in the text that we may not be accustomed with. In the Hebrew mind, a long life and a family legacy, that was a sign that you were blessed by God. In the culture of that day, they viewed if you live a long life, you're blessed by God. If you were fortunate enough to parent children and see your grandchildren, that was an indication that God had blessed you. So we're supposed to see in a text that a man has great fortune and fame. He has wealth and possessions. He's living a long life. He's got a family legacy. In other words, this gentleman, he has everything that the culture of that day would say, man, if you have that, you have it all. He's got the perfect life according to the culture of his day. Yet notice the text. What does it tell us about him? Yet his soul is not satisfied. He has everything the culture says that would contribute to a good and a happy life. A life that everyone would want to live. Yet Solomon says he has it all, yet his soul is unsatisfied. Notice the depth of his disappointment. It reaches to the depths of his soul. The soul, that's the immaterial part of who we are. It's the real person. This disappointment has went to the core of his existence. There's a hole in his heart. His spirit is empty. His soul is broken. He has no rest for his soul. See, what the culture said would fulfill him, what he thought would fulfill him and satisfy him, he would only get to the end of his days to realize, my life is pretty meaningless. Nothing has satisfied. That's what the imagery about the place of no burial is all about. 
He gets to the end of his days and he has no burial or a burial place. See, what was true about his life was also about true in his death. He will not be remembered. It's as if he's never lived. And then in maybe one of the most gut-wrenching comparisons in all of Scripture, Solomon compares this rich man who has everything for a good life to that of a stillborn child. Some of our translations will say a miscarried child. The point is the same. And as we explain this text, I want us to explain it with great empathy and compassion because in the church of our size, there have been dozens of families that have walked through the tragedy, the misfortune of miscarriage. I say one in four pregnancies end in miscarriage. It's something that Chelsea and I, we've dealt with, we've walked through that as well. We're two years past the miscarriage of our kid and we still have great sorrow, questions, guilt. It's a tragedy to lose a child. There is not a greater pain for a parent than for that to be your reality. So as we explain this, I want to explain it knowing that we've walked through this. And if you're walking through that now, if you've walked through that in the past, we as the body, we're in this together. We care for one another in this. We grieve together. And also, as we explain this, I want to explain it that it's true to the text where we feel the weight of what Solomon is saying. You see, every time that Chelsea tells me that she's pregnant, for me, I don't know about any other guys in here, there's a moment of shock. What do you mean? You're not pregnant? Are you serious? How did that happen? Are you, you're crazy, right? Not again? Like, it's just like, there's a moment of shock. And then, there's an extended time of celebration. Yeah, we're having a baby, we're having a kid, let's do it, this is awesome. So you start making plans, you make preparations, you get the rooms in order. There's so much to do in that window of time, and there's this time where you expect, you anticipate that moment where you're going to be able to hold your child, hold your baby, you're going to be able to to hug it and kiss it, and, and to just live life happily ever after. Until you walk into the doctor's office and the doctor comes in and tells you the horrific news that you've lost your kid. That the expectation has now turned to tragedy. And there is not a more grievous evil under the sun than to have to walk through that. See, what Solomon is doing here, he's, he's acknowledging miscarriage. It's one of the most tragic things in all of human experience. Yet he says, believe it or not, there's something even more tragic than that. It's the tragedy of you being given everything that you've ever wanted in life. And not find satisfaction and contentment in it. For you to be given everything that you've ever desired, yet your soul be at unrest. The preacher says, it's better for that baby to be miscarried at birth than for you to miscarry your life. You're better off to be miscarried at birth than to be given everything you've ever wanted in life and for you to waste your life. Why is it better? Why is it better? Because the preacher says that that the miscarried one, 
It never has to endure the pains of life. It never has to endure the sufferings of this world. It doesn't have to endure the the conviction of sins committed against our God. No, no. In the goodness and graciousness of our God, He takes the miscarry and it is placed in the eternal presence and joy of our Savior forevermore. Yet the man in the text, he goes throughout life. He works hard. He toils all of his day. He acquires everything that he could possibly want only to get to the end of his life and realize my soul is at unrest. He has a restless soul because nothing that he is aiming for in life is able to satisfy, to mend, to fix his soul. He's a broken man and nothing in all the world can fix him. You see, his allotment in life, his current condition is a sign of his spiritual condition. He's unsatisfied in his life because his soul is unsatisfied in God. He is a restless man. See, rest here in the text, it means to be free from toil, to be free from hardship, to be free from misery and pain. It's the type of rest that has been absent in the human experience since the fall of Adam in Genesis chapter 3. Since the fall of Adam, the human life has been characterized by an ongoing pursuit of work and of toil, never to find rest. There's nothing in all of creation, no matter how much effort and pursuit you put into it, is able to mend the brokenness of your soul. He says it wouldn't matter if we lived a thousand years twice over. If your soul's not at rest, it doesn't matter. If we are not at rest in God, nothing else matters. So what is the hope for us? Where can we find rest? If life is characterized, life under the sun, if it's characterized by endless hardship and toil, where can we find rest? Well, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So today, you look to your life, and even though you have fame and fortune, you have a long life and a family legacy, you can look to your life and see that your soul is at unrest. What do you do? Come to Jesus, and He will give you rest. Come to Jesus, and He will take the the, the burden off of you. You've labored long enough. Come to Jesus and find rest. You have labored. You're heavy laden. Come to Jesus and let Him take that weight of sin and shame off of your life and you will find rest. He is the only one that can satisfy you. He is the only one that can give your soul rest. Come to Jesus and rest in Him. So wealth and possessions don't satisfy. A long life and a family legacy don't satisfy. Verse 7. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? What does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This is also vanity and a striving after the wind. Disappointment number three is this. That desire and accomplishment do not satisfy. Desire and accomplishment do not satisfy. Solomon here, he's moving a little bit more in cynical in nature. He says, well, man, if nothing is able to satisfy, if I can't find satisfaction under the sun, maybe I just won't crave anything. Maybe I just won't desire anything. It's kind of like that time when you are young, maybe you're in middle school or something, and you're supposed to make some goals for yourself, and you purposefully put those goals really low so when you don't hit them, you're less dissatisfied with yourself. That's kind of what he's saying here. Like, maybe I just won't crave anything. Maybe I just won't satisfy anything. The problem with that is that we are ferocious 
in our attempts to satisfy the soul. In other words, we have a constant appetite. We desire things over and over and over again. And we go hard after the things that we think will satisfy us. He says in verse 7, All of the toil of man is for his mouth. The mouth there is a metaphor for desire. We go hard after the things that we think will satisfy the cravings of our life. And it doesn't matter what gets in our way. We will do anything necessary. We, by all means necessary, we will accomplish what we think will satisfy. Some says, let me boil it all the way down for you. Let's shoot it straight. So at the end of the day, here's what life is. You work so you can eat. Then you eat so you can work. And then you work again so you can eat. And then you die. We crave all types of things, don't we? Food, water, entertainment, leisure, prosperity. And whatever that craving is that is unique to us, whatever we go after, there's nothing in our way that's going to prevent us from that pursuit. And we will only get there and we'll realize it never satisfies. We'll realize that life is just like a treadmill. That we'll run for a hundred miles. And we'll run with all of the energy that we have, only to realize when you get off the treadmill, you went nowhere. Nothing has satisfied. But notice also, desires are not only the only thing vain in life, also accomplishments. Verse 8 tells us that what advantage has the wise man over the fool? What does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? In other words, both the wise man and the poor man, they have the same allotment in life. They deal with the same thing, although they take different avenues to get there. They're both dissatisfied in what they accomplish. He says it doesn't matter if the poor man, by all things against him, who starts at the bottom and works his way all the way to the top, even if he makes it all the way to the top, he'll get to the top and realize his soul is not satisfied. It's not enough. It's never enough. And we as Americans, I think we know this better than most. Like we've bought into this idea of the American dream, haven't we? And I'm not saying that the American dream is wrong or that we're perfect as a nation. Because we're not. We have our issues. We acknowledge that. But generally speaking, it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, your family lineage, none of that matters. Generally speaking, everyone who calls the United States of America home, we are afforded the same opportunity of education, advancement, and prosperity. Solomon is not saying that pursuing the American dream is wrong. But the wisdom of Solomon would say, hey, you might end up chasing after the American dream only finding out it was a nightmare for you. That you would get everything that you would ever want. That you would be able to start from the bottom and you would accomplish everything set before you. You would graduate high school. You would graduate college. You would get that degree. You'd get that master's degree. You'd get that doctorate. You'd be able to live and work how you please. And you would accomplish, accomplish, accomplish only to realize that urge in your heart has never been quenched. That's what leads Solomon to conclude in verse 9. It's better to live contently with what you have rather than have an appetite that continues to wander. So if you're going to make the choice to live life underneath the sun, in this continual rat race, where you're going to be tempted to chase after everything before your eyes, it's better off just to learn to live contently with what you have, rather than to have a wandering appetite. Our appetites, they always wander and they never arrive. We're always chasing after something else, something new, something that we believe is better. 
not realizing that all the accomplishments, all the desires of our heart never fulfill the longings of our soul. Verse 10, let's close it out. Whatever has come has already been named, and it is known what man is, that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage of man? For who knows what is good for a man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which passes like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? The fourth disappointment listened in the text is this. Knowledge and the answers to life's questions do not satisfy. Knowledge and answers to life's questions do not satisfy. Here Solomon reminds us of human nature, our human existence. He says, it's known what man is. It reminds us of our creation back in Genesis 1 and 2. Man is from the dust. We are one of God's creations formed by the hands of God. We are dust, Solomon says. And from the dust we will return. He's kind of putting us in our place here. He says, you're going to have those times in life when you want the answers to certain questions. You want to know why God is doing what He is doing. And maybe in a little bit of a rebuke here, He reminds ourselves, well, we know who man is. Dust created by God. We're not able to contend with one stronger than than He. We're not able to dispute with God, He says. He is God, we are not. He is Creator, I am the creation. I have no business telling God how to govern His creation. Even if it was possible for me to acquire a type of knowledge that God has, Even if I was able to plead my case before God and He would give me the answers that I so long to have, it would not change a thing in my life. It's not going to change. Someone says it's better. If you're unhappy in this life, it's just better off for you not to dispute with God. Because even if you had all the knowledge and all of the answers to your question, God is sovereign. He is the one who governs His creation. We are His creation living at His mercy. And we need to learn how to live underneath the sun. It's not going to change. And he ends with two questions. Two questions that I think are operate as reflect. We're supposed to ponder the answer to these questions. For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which passes like a shadow? Question two, who can tell a man what will be after him underneath the sun? Two questions that point us to ponder, to think about purpose and meaning and satisfaction. It's as if Solomon is putting us in a place where we are supposed to wrestle with this idea, wrestle with this question, is there any satisfaction to be found underneath the sun? And if there's not any type of satisfaction and fulfillment to be found underneath the sun, is there a possibility of me being fulfilled in the next life? Is there a life after this? My friends, that is the question that Solomon has been getting after. He wants to press us to think and to evaluate our lives to where we come to the point where we would say, man, I've chased after a lot in this life. And I found that wealth and possessions don't satisfy. A long life and a family legacy, that doesn't satisfy me either. I've tried desires and accomplishments and that wasn't able to fulfill the the longings of my soul. And because I'm one of God's creation, I'll never have the ability to to know like He knows and I'll never have all the answers that I, I would like to have in this life. He's pressing us to the point where we would confess that a life lived under the sun, a life lived apart from God, will be full of expectation, but it will be absent of satisfaction. So is there any hope for satisfaction for people like you and me? As I was thinking about that, a 
one of my favorite stories in the New Testament popped in my mind. In John chapter 4, Jesus is speaking to a woman at a well. And she's a Samaritan woman. She's an outcast. She's been rejected and hurt and disappointed her entire life. She's been on this endless quest to find satisfaction, to find fulfillment. She's in a place where she's physically thirsty. She's at a well, drawing some water. And Jesus comes to her, and he begins a conversation. And as Jesus converses with this Samaritan woman, we find out that she has tried to find that fulfillment in relationships, and those relationships have just left her dirty, broken, and hurt. And Jesus, in her brokenness, in her despair, shows her that just as she's physically thirsty, just like she's at that well to quench a physical thirst, The living water has arrived to quench her spiritual thirst. See, her physical life is an indication of her spiritual life. She physically thirsts, and that's an indication that she's spiritually thirsty. That she's tried to find fulfillment and satisfaction in all different avenues, only to leave herself thirsting for more. And Jesus, what does he do? He comes right to her, and he meets her where she's at, and he presents himself as the living water, and he says this to her. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Translation, anything that you are chasing after to find fulfillment for your soul, you may be able to pacify that for a moment, but you'll have to come back to it again. You'll be thirsty again and again. And Jesus says to her, but whoever drinks of the water that I give to him, will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Oh, we will always be thirsty in this life when we try to quench the thirst of our lives with something other than Jesus. Jesus, he is the living water that has come to us to satisfy the thirst of our soul fully, finally, and forevermore. So if you are thirsting this morning, come to Jesus, the fountain of living water. Oh, come drink deeply from the fountain of living water and be satisfied. So would you come? See, the beauty of the gospel says that satisfaction and fulfillment and purpose and meaning in life, it doesn't have to be absent. You can find it, and you find it in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, God, He's created you on purpose and for a purpose. He's created you for the purpose of knowing Him, loving Him, and worshiping Him. But in our sin, we've rebelled against our Creator. And we are separated from the relationship that we are designed to have with Him. And in our brokenness, we are trying to fix the brokenness of our soul. We are trying to satisfy our souls with things that are temporary that are unable to satisfy. Because of our sin, we had a death sentence hanging over our head where the full wrath of God would be poured out onto us. Oh, what a tragic life it would be to live this life and be dissatisfied your entire life and then experience the full wrath of God for all of eternity. What a tragedy that would be. But it doesn't have to be that way. The good news of the gospel says that Jesus has come. God himself in the form of man has come and he lived a perfect and sinless life. The life that you and I couldn't live. He went to the cross and he died the death that we deserve to die. He arose again securing in himself new and eternal life. So when we repent of our sin and place our faith and trust in Jesus, we'll no longer be dissatisfied in life, but we'll finally find fulfillment. We'll finally find satisfaction and it's found in Jesus and Jesus alone. So this morning, as the band comes and we begin to enter into a time of response, the question is, are you satisfied? Is your soul satisfied? If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, we would love to speak with you about that. There's going to be pastors up front that we'd love to talk to you about it. 
Christian, if you're, yes, I, I, I belong to Jesus, but there's something broken in my heart. There's still something broken I'm wrestling with. I don't know that I'm completely satisfied. Could it be for you that you are chasing after other things? You're substituting the satisfaction that's been found in Jesus and you are reverting back to a life prior to Christ. You're chasing after things that will never be able to, to satisfy you. The call for the Christian and the non-Christian alike this morning is the same. Come to Jesus, the fountain of living water, and be satisfied.